So that's Luke chapter 1, 39 through to 58, and that's page 725. Sorry, 724. <clears throat> At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favoured that he, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has been mindful of <coughs> the humble state of his servant. From now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones. He has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers, Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. And when it was time for Elizabeth to have the baby, her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbours and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy and they shared her joy. So far, the reading. Well, do keep a, a Bible open there in front of you. Uh, the Pew Bible, is, again, is 724. And we're looking at verses, verses 39 through to 56. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we come to your word as needy people. We pray that, that you would speak to us. We pray that just as your old covenant people here saw the day of fulfillment, the day of redemption, and rejoiced and had hope. Lord, give us hope and joy through believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask it in his name. Amen. Well, last week we, we looked at that story that is spoken of in terms of the Annunciation of the angel Gabriel explaining that she was to have a baby, the Lord Jesus himself. And now we have Mary's reaction as we move on. And, and in fact, as we read through Luke, we see that many of these early stories are bound together with, with Mary. Uh, in a lot of ways, she's the, an actress who, who cuts across many of the scenes and provides a sort of running thread. Now, if you note that, there are various things that you might do with it. But one temptation, uh, I think, for us as Protestants, as we read about Mary, is to feel a little uncomfortable and to say, oh, there's lots about Mary in here. Perhaps we'll put that to one side and move on and come back to things that seem uh, less dangerous. There, there is a perception, isn't there, and I think rightly so, that some people, particularly Catholics, have had an unhealthy interest in Mary. Now, if that sounds like a strong thing to say, uh, we need only bring to mind the way that some Christians have spoken of Mary as if she were a mediatrix, a female mediator, as if she is someone who is full of grace and is there in heaven to pour out grace on us. And so she is to be prayed to and even, in a sense, worshipped. And 
At that point, you see, it is to go far beyond Scripture. It is to go far beyond Scripture because it cannot help not only to go against what Scripture teaches, but to undercut the Lord Jesus, to undercut the glory of God, that the salvation that God provides in his Son is enough. Furthermore, it often centers around turning to Mary as if she is somehow compassionate, motherly, kind, as opposed to her son. What a terrible thing to say. As if we as believers cannot go directly to the Lord Jesus. Is that not what Scripture enjoins on us? That we can come boldly to the throne of grace, directly through the Lord Jesus himself, and expect to find a God of compassion and mercy, a God who has the kindness of a mother and turns towards us to hear our prayers. You see, there is no way really of giving that kind of devotion to Mary as a kind of mediator or go-between without undercutting the Lord Jesus, her son. So we surely shouldn't honor Mary like that. We shouldn't worship her. We shouldn't place our trust in her. We shouldn't turn to her in prayer. But that said, there is an honor that she is due here. If we, if we rightly perhaps uh, react and say we shouldn't treat Mary as some people have in being devoted to her like that, we shouldn't dismiss her because the scriptures themselves here push us towards seeing Mary as someone to be honored. Someone that we ought to speak well of. Someone who is blessed and we ought to say, as she says herself, all generations from now on will say how blessed I am. Now that ought to give us a bit of a clue in itself. How is it that people are blessed in the Bible? Well, it's as sinful people like us, from a merciful God. As we go into the story here, you, you, we see Mary responding to this annunciation. She knows she's going to have this child by a miracle, and so she seems to turn to the only other one who's in the same boat. She's heard about Elizabeth. She's heard how Elizabeth is going to have a child by a miracle. And so she seems to rush towards her. Well, here's somebody else who understands what's going on, at least partly. Maybe this is why my relative, perhaps she's thinking to herself, has shut herself up these past six months. She's pregnant at an old age. And so she goes to her. And as she goes, we, we see this honor coming out, this honor that Mary is given from her relative. We have to remember that Mary and Elizabeth are quite different people. Mary is young, probably 13 or 14. She's not yet married. That's the kind of age that girls would be when they were betrothed. She's really, really young. And Elizabeth is older. We don't know how old, but obviously older and, and therefore worthy of more honor. She comes from an honorable family. She's from a priestly line and a very particular priestly line. Her husband has a very important priestly job. And so as she comes to her, she goes to her, as the lesser to the greater. And as a lesser would be expected to do when she comes into the house, she greets her. And yet as soon as Elizabeth hears the greetings, the tables are chained. The, 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 the whole order of things is, is, is turned, isn't it? Verse 42, in a loud voice she exclaims, Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the child you will bear. And she lowers herself, verse 43, why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? You see, this is all about how Elizabeth really is more honored, and yet she, she debases herself and gives honor to Mary. I think for two reasons we see here. One, because she is at that moment bearing the Lord himself. Why should the mother of my Lord come to me? She's speaking about Jesus already in her womb. More than that, she calls him here Lord. It's Old Testament language for God. She's recognizing in the womb of this woman is God of God being born as a man. And so she lowers herself. Mary has an honor because she carries the Savior. 
But also Mary has another honor, not so much a derivative honor, well, a different kind of derivative honor. The honor she speaks of later in the song. All generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me. Mary gets an honor because the Lord did amazing things for her, unique things. No one else bears the Savior. Not because she was somehow peculiarly good, but because the Lord put her favor, his favor on her in mercy and in grace. So she's not, and it's an unfortunate mistranslation, she is not Hail Mary full of grace. In fact, if you turn back to the Annunciation, just turn back. We, we see those words, but more properly translated. Verse 28, greetings, that is, hail Mary, you who are highly favored. You see, she is one who is peculiar because she has a peculiar favor from God to bear the Lord Jesus himself. She's not full of grace to pour it out on anyone else but she's graciously under the favor of God. So it's, it's worth just saying that, so that as we read about Mary, we don't try to sort of push her to one side. Luke doesn't want us to do that. But neither is Luke writing here to tell us about Mary for Mary's sake. You see, remember, Luke is writing to Theophilus. Luke wants to assure Theophilus and us about not so much Mary, but Jesus Christ. And in fact, as he, as he speaks here about Mary and her reaction and her song, he casts it, and even Mary herself casts the whole episode in a way that says this is not just for her. There is unique favor here. We didn't bear the Messiah. But Mary describes herself and is treated in a way that encourages us to see ourselves in her. See, just as Luke's writing to Theophilus to say in, the, in that old-fashioned way, you have an interest in this. That is, this is for you, Theophilus. So Luke is telling us about Mary because he's saying, there's something here for us. There's something here in which actually we can find ourselves knowing the God that Mary knows trusting in the God that Mary trusts in, in the way that she does. That is to say, Mary's put forward here as well as a model. She's unique, yes, but she's mainly here a model in two ways. A model of what God does for his people, but also a model of believing response. So firstly, Mary here as a model, an object lesson of God's mercy see, Mary, here's the greeting. She's confirmed in that faith that she's had. Yes, God is going to do what he said. Let it be to me as the Lord said. I'll have this child. He'll be the Savior. And so she sings this wonderful song, verse 46. My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. It deliberately echoes many songs from the Old Testament of deliverance of salvation, of God acting for his people. And yet, as you read through this song, sometimes called the Magnificat, there are, there are some things to note here. Notice this song is all about how she has conceived a child. And yet, that's not the way she speaks about it. All the language is focused in this very Old Testament way about God is coming to save his people. You see here how God's word explains what's happening and then interprets it. Jesus is coming to be born. A baby's being born. What does it mean? What is the meaning of Christmas? Verses 46 to 56. God is coming to save his people. It's all about God's action. There's lots of verbs here about God doing. God will do mighty things. He has done mighty things. He has shown the strength of his arm. Here is a God who acts and who works on behalf of his people. And the way Mary describes it, she's talking about herself. 
The, the Lord, mighty God, has done amazing things for me, verse 49. And yet, the way she describes it is to invite others in, is to say, yes, he's doing unique things for me. I'm, have, I'm bearing the Messiah. And yet, these are things that God does for his people generally. You can see that in specific references to other people. Verse 54, this, the bearing of the Messiah through her uniquely, is him helping his servant Israel. Is him remembering his promises and acting to Abraham and, in fact, all the Israelites. But it's not just for Israel. It is, verse 50, his mercy which extends to all those who fear him. And not just those who fear him, but those who fear him throughout all generations. You see, there were many, I'm sure, in these days who had joined themselves to Israel, who were Gentiles, sometimes called God-fearers, who feared the Lord. And here Mary says, this bearing of Jesus Christ is God working on my behalf, but also on behalf of all Abraham's descendants and even those who are not descended from Abraham. She widens it up, and she, she widens it up not just in terms of people she's describing, but in terms of the kind of state that she's in, the kind of person that she is, verse 48, particularly of her, he has been mindful of my humble estate. Mary says, God's noticed how I'm in such a low position and has acted for me. And yet notice this is not just unique for her, but it goes out to others. Verse 51, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud he brings down rulers from their thrones, but he has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things. He has sent the rich away empty. You see, Mary's already going at a distinctive theme of Luke, that the way God acts is topsy-turvy, upside down. His power comes into the world, and it seems to find great purchase among those who are needy, and it lifts them up. And yet those who are already exalted, in some sense, we'll come back to, are put down. Why? It's, it's, uh, it's worth, as we, as we keep going through Luke, to ask, why is God's kingdom topsy-turvy? Why does it go against the way the world works? Well, we see one reason here. Because the God who is acting is powerful, mighty, he bears his arm to act. He uses his power. And his power is so full, so great, that it goes right to the bottom. It goes right to the bottom to those who have no power and no resources of their own. See, in that sense, God is not like a furniture removal guy. If you ever have someone come to help you move furniture, a professional, and they come in and they always make someone like me feel very diminutive and they're big and sort of muscly and they've got often those belts to help their backs and they're sort of barrel chested, right? You see one of these guys, you think, man, he could probably bench press twice my weight. And yet, when it comes to a sofa, what do they do? With all their power, I think you'll have to get the other end, I'm afraid. Their power is so much greater than ours, than mine, and yet, they still need someone to help them, don't they? They need someone to get the other end. And Mary's God is not like that. His power is such that it doesn't need someone who has a little bit to help. It doesn't need someone who can get the other end. And so it comes right down to those who have no help. Nothing to give, nothing to provide, nothing with which to cooperate with God, who are of humble estate, who have no resources, no power, no status. You see, God particularly regards those who are humble. And it's interesting then that, that Luke is recording this and saying, Theophilus, you who are noble, important, probably of high honor, you need to hear about this. 
Now, notice there's a way we could get this wrong, and some people do. They say then, well, God is for the weak and the poor and the lowly, but those who are rich or important or honorable, well, God doesn't want to have anything to do with them. It would be a rather difficult thing to fly past the Gospel of Luke. Dear Theophilus, you who are rich and noble, this has nothing to do with you. End of book. You see, he's not warning Theophilus that in itself you cannot be a Christian and be honored or rich or powerful. But he warns him as to how he thinks about that power. The danger is not to be lifted up so much as to be lifted up in the imagination of your hearts, as the King James puts it. To be lifted up into, in such a way that you say, I am rich and powerful and I have status and therefore I am sufficient. And I do not need a God like this. And so already Luke challenges Theophilus and us that if we would know this God, we must be like Mary. And in fact, like Elizabeth, who was honored and yet humbled herself before the Lord. Who are you, Lord? to come to someone like me. We have to start with need. And where we're needy, the Lord is full of power. And the only place here in Mary's song that that power doesn't reach to is those who say, I don't want that power. I don't need that power. I'm sufficient to myself. Mary then is a model of, of humility and really just recognizing that her state is low, accepts the grace of God, a God who comes to act on her behalf. And in that sense, she is a model of salvation. You see, it's, it's worth going back this week and, and singing with Mary this song and saying, this is who I am before the Lord. As I encounter daily problems that are too much for me, and how much more so if I can't deal with some administrator who won't do what I want? How much less so can I deal with the great spiritual things of sin and of death and of Satan and of hell? I'm needy like this. And yet, therefore, God's grace is for me. God's power is for me. God's favor is for me and for you. See, God's salvation is powerful and for those who are low and needy. Mary's a model of that kind of salvation. She's also, secondly here though, a model of what it means to respond believingly to it. Notice as we've been moving through these early chapters, Luke has quite a concern about faith. He wrote to Theophilus, I want you to be certain. There's something about faith about that, isn't there? Knowing. And as he begins to tell his story, he talks about Zechariah and how Zechariah heard the word of the Lord and failed to believe it. Prove it to me, angel. And he was disciplined for his unbelief, though not finally in the mercy of God. And as we meet Mary and we see her contrasting response earlier on, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be just as you've said. And particularly here in verse 45, you see, Mary is a model believer. As Elizabeth looks at her by the Holy Spirit, he's again God exegeting the situation, unpacking what's going on. Verse 45, by the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth says, blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. You see, Elizabeth brings out the nature of Mary's faith here. She believes what the Lord says. That's where faith finds its terminus. It, it's where faith goes. It goes to the word of the Lord. But, but something particular about God's word, that what God said has, will be accomplished, literally will be finished, will be completed. We, we might think, what, what word would you, would you put with the promise of God? Promise and then fulfillment. And, and Luke uses that word a lot. And yet here we have promise and completion, promise and end, promise and it's all done. 
And notice as Mary goes on to speak about what the Lord's doing, that's what it's like. It's final language. Perhaps we're used, so used to reading it that we think, well, she's sort of talking in these evocative terms, and yet she's speaking in final terms. He scattered the proud. They're done. He has put down those who love themselves and are exalted kings against him. He puts them down. And those who are humble, his people who are oppressed, he lifts up fully and finally and vindicates. You see, what God has promised to Mary and to us is full and final new creation, justice done, things sorted out, his promises completed. And Elizabeth says, that's what Mary believes. Her faith hears the word of God and moves forward and sees something and says about Jesus. Here is completion. Here is fulfillment. The end has come. And do you see that, that that goes through the whole song? You might expect her to say, Jesus is coming, and so watch out, you exalted people. You're going to come down. At the end, it will go badly for you. God at the end will vindicate his people, and yet notice all the past tenses in her song. He's done it. He's humbled. He's brought low. He's lifted up. She's heard the word of God, and yet now she has a certainty that comes from seeing Jesus by faith in the womb and saying, already now, already now, even in the midst of God's plan, it's done. It's completed. It's over. As, as an Englishman, I can't help but I can't help but think of the 1966 Soccer World Cup. England's one moment of great soccer glory, which we shall never relive probably. And England were playing Germany in the final. And it was 2-2 at full time. And so they played extra time. And Jeff Hurst scores. And so it's looking like England are going to win. And it's down to the last minute. And it's into the final seconds, and the crowd are straining, actually, to go onto the pitch. And the commentator's looking at the crowd and says, they think it's all over. And then Jeff Hurst scores in the final seconds, and he says, it is now. There are seconds still to go on the clock. But everyone knows it's done. It's 4-2. And there's hardly any time left to run. And Mary knows that there is a child in her womb. And by faith, she says, it's all done. It's all over. There is no turning this back. We are in the final seconds. God has completed his promises. She sees a model of belief here. And if you're anything like me, there is a weird push-pull about that, to look at Mary, to see God acting for her, to see her responding in so fullness of faith with the certainty that Luke wants for Theophilus and for us, and that push and pull, how attractive, how wonderful, isn't this how it's meant to be, isn't this the right relationship of Lord to servant, and also the pushing away of knowing that how often we're not like this, how often our faith is uncertain, unsure, and so Mary attracts us and in some sense she repels us. But again, Luke doesn't set forward Mary here as a model for us to measure ourselves against and say, I, I fall short, there's nothing for me here but as a model to get faith, to see where Mary is looking. Where does she look for the certainty? She doesn't look at how certain she is. 
That, that is the way that leads to death. How certain am I? Well, not very certain. It must not be very certain then. Well, I suppose I'm not very certain. Well, I shan't be very certain then. Where is she looking? By faith, as it were, I mean, I know it's ahead of schedule, but she's looking at the bump. She's looking down and saying, God promised, and it was certain then, and yet now, as Peter says, do we not have the word of God made more certain? Hear this child come in the midst of time. You see, is the great seal, the great oath that God is keeping his promise, that God will complete and has already now in the Lord Jesus almost fully completed his plans. You see, what, what more do you really need than the word of God? You shouldn't need more. But the Lord provides more. He speaks in promise, and yet here, in the birth of this child, for weak people like us, he says, Amen. And he shows us his Amen, this child of promise being born, who is the completion of all God's plans. You see, Luke wants certainty for Theophilus, and so he says, look at Mary. Look at how God acted for her, and look at where her faith found certainty in Jesus Christ, the word of the prophets made certain. See, Mary is unique, and I don't think we should brush over her as unique. Uniquely honored, uniquely favored, but Luke wants us to look here at Mary as a model. A model of a story about Jesus Christ that we're drawn into as well. Mercy for other needy people. And certainty and sureness about the future through Jesus Christ for those who need help and are weak in faith. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you that you were born a child in the midst of time as the great amen to the promises of God. Lord, we thank you that we live in these final moments of your plans. That we see this child here, this great completion. That we've heard the words, it is finished. Lord, strengthen our faith as we look to him. Lord, we find much reason for disconcert in the world, in others, in ourselves. But thank you that in Jesus Christ we see your face, faithful, acting on our behalf, proving, as it were, yourself to us. And Lord, we ask that you might make our faith through him certain and joyful and expectant as these believers were. We ask it in Jesus' name and to your glory. Amen.